Welcome everyone to another Conquest Call-In Show live. Uh, as always, every Friday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, we're here. This is your show. We may not be the last, but we were the first to make a show just for you Trojan fans to come on and let us know what you want to talk about in the program, what your fears are, what your excitement is for the season. We thought it might be fun. It's kind of a slow-ish week going on at USC. You got uh, spring ball coming up later this week. You have a pro day coming up that Caleb's probably going to be throwing at. Uh, a lot of exciting news at the end of the month. Not so much here kind of in the middle of, uh, of the month. So we're going to do uh, a Mount Rushmore of, of USC football. And basing it, I'd be too much if we try to do the history of USC football. And even this, going from 2000 to present, might be a bit hard to find four spots. But we're all going to try to do our best. So, guys, when you call in, uh, it's not a requirement, but if you could slap down your Mount Rushmore, it would be great. But as always, this is your show to talk about whatever you like. Matt, we got a call right now. Before we talk, let's just jump right in. How does that sound? Absolutely. Uh, all right, caller, you're the first one up. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is uh, Gary from Dana Point. Gary, how you doing? Missed your hey, call last doing? week. Yeah, I couldn't get through uh, due to the uh, phone situation. So, um, anyway, great to see you guys. I was uh, trying to get through here, so I, I didn't quite hear your opening. So, my I don't know if my topic's on topic or on point or not, but nevertheless, my, my call has to do with expectations. And, you know, having, uh, you know, been around the planet for a while, I recently got off of Noah's Ark, so that's how old I am. But there's a famous football player named Elroy Crazy Legs Hirsch. For the Rams. He played for the Rams. Yeah. Yeah, you guys probably know him because you're historians. But he later went on to coach the Rams. And in those days, 1961, they, they practiced at uh, Chapman College. You could go to every practice if you wanted to. So I showed up with some of my friends, and we watched the practice. Afterwards, we talked with Crazy Legs Hirsch. And he said... When they asked him, well, what's it look like next year? He said, oh, we're 10 days ahead of last year. And I was really excited. And I went home and I told my dad. And my dad said, they say that every year. <laughs> and so I was kind of crestfallen. And in talking to the guys at the gym that I hang with, if you tune around the country, apparently almost every college is going to win a natty this year. Um, because of the uh, way in which they're hyping their situation. Now, maybe they're real, but here's what I appreciate about you guys. I don't get hype from you guys. Give you an example. Benny Wiley, according to Matt, is typhoid Mary. And according to Tim, <laughs> he's not typhoid Mary. Now, obviously, I'm making a joke here. But uh, I really was wondering, this is a desert time right now, and I just wonder what your expectations are. And factor in one thing that I don't understand how do you explain the holiday bowl? How do you explain it? And one of the players said, now we a team. And I'm wondering what, how that factors in the mix here. So that's my question. What are your guys' expectations? We're sitting here in the middle of the Sahara Desert in March. Yeah, no, fascinating. But by, before I let you go, Gary, and while we give our answer, if I want you to think about if you had to pick a, a Mount Rushmore from 2000 on. So we're talking... You know, basically Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll basically. Well, who, yeah. Who, who who would be those four spots? But um, <laughs> Matt, so really quickly, expectations and um, and why, why did they become a team in the Holiday Bowl, in your opinion? Well, Gary, thanks for the call. As always, love you starting off the show uh, as, as you usually do. And, you know, one of the reasons we keep this straight uh, at Trojans Wire and, and here at the Voice of College Football is that, you know, we remember the trauma of the Clay Helton years and the trauma of the Clay Helton years was increased and sustained uh, because of sunshine pumping. That was what Clay Helton was uh, infamous for, that, you know, it, it would be a it would be a thunderstorm and he'd still find a way to tell us that the sun's shining and isn't it bright and beautiful. You can't be a mature, serious program and you can't compete for championships. You can't have accountability if you aren't willing to tell unpleasant, inconvenient, often harsh truths. And so you have to keep it real. You can't just, you can't just sunshine pump. That, that's why we do what we do. And that's why we do it the way we do it here at the Voice of College Football. So thank you, Gary, for that. So in terms of expectations, you know, I think uh, the spring portal 
needs to unearth a, a big get on, on par with Bear Alexander last spring. You know, I think that that's a, that's a piece of the puzzle we still need to see. And we also need to see Josh Henson step up to the plate. I think those are the two main things. A big spring portal addition, preferably on defense, and, and specifically the defensive line. And then Josh Henson stepping up. If you if USC gets those, can check those two boxes, all right, I think we're good. I think that 10-2 and two and a playoff berth uh, would be realistic. Uh expectations and, and with this schedule 10 and 2 will be a playoff season now that now that there are 12 teams 12 slots uh for the playoff but we need to see josh henson prove it and we need to see uh the spring portal on earth at least one really big splash that significantly beefs up the roster like i'm on the fence right now in terms of whether usc has enough dudes um I, you know i think the defensive coaching staff is going to improve players so significantly that's why the holiday bowl went the way it did taylor may is coaching up a storm and you had bad coaches alex grinch and dante williams out of the picture so that was addition by subtraction uh i think i think the coaches are gonna make more of what we have but we don't have quite enough uh right now uh and if josh henson can take those young guys on the o-line that tim's so high on and he and he does a great job of developing uh, that offensive front. And we get back to the 2022 standard on the offensive line. And we put 2023 in the rear view mirror. It can all come together. So that I think that's a blend of realism and optimism. And we just need to see where those plot points go. Yeah, I, I Gary, I, I'm, I'm kind of with Matt. It's going to see we, there are some ads that need to be made. Uh, that's that's there's there's no doubt. Do we have skill at every position? I think we have made yeah, huge I upgrades. I, I I think that we're we're going through the season with a great group of starters. The worry is going to be is playing in the Big Ten, getting banged up. Not only Big Ten, but you know you're going to have your two of your non conference games, one against Notre Dame, one against LSU, two other brands of football known to be pretty damn tough and pretty damn big. These guys are going to get smacked around, and how healthy they're going to be in November is going to go a long way in telling us what kind of season this team's going to have. So uh, what, what I think is going to happen, I want to see some depth on the interior defensive line. And as much as I've been banging the drum for how I am, and I truly am excited about this off young offensive line, they need another veteran voice on that line. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be. They just need someone. We've learned that, you know, it's been hit or miss, right? We had Bobby Haskins come in and just kind of fill that gap perfectly in, in Lincoln Riley's first year. And then, you know, we just had that kind of shuffle thing we had going on last year, bring in uh, Kingston, you know, and, and bumping around, not really figure out who we're going to put on that right tackle position. Uh, we need a little more depth, and it's going to be in those two line positions. I think we're fine everywhere else. I really do. Uh, I would like to see us add another defensive tackle and another offensive tackle. Uh, not that I don't think we have offensive tackles in that young group that can play well, but we might need some – some college size defensive tackle, some, you know, I'm not going to demean that. These guys are huge. They'll probably squash me, but some man size strength, you know, on, on the tackle position going into the big 10. So short answer, sorry. Uh, we need depth because uh, what happens in November is going to be the definitive, the definitive thing. Even though the tough games are early, right? Three of the toughest games are early in the season. I think that down that stretch is going to see what is USC made of. Because we've been questioning for the last couple of years' strength. We've been questioning uh, the, the toughness, not just the physical, but mental toughness. Let's see what this team has. You got that list for me, Gary? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the, the Mount Rushmore of top players, you're talking 2,000 forward? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to slip in John Arnett from the 50s. He was an unbelievable player. But obviously, I'm going to put Reggie Bush in there, uh, Clay Matthews, and I I think Drake London is one for me. I think he's going to be rewriting the, the, the some of the records in the NFL. But anyway, hey, I appreciate you guys and uh, your perspective, and it's just so encouraging. So fight on, guys. We'll, we'll talk next week. Fight on, Gary. Look forward to that call every single week. Thank you so much Thank for calling in, as always. And I was going to say, hang on to uh, Jaguar John Arnett. Because uh, we're going to do a pre-2000 probably next week because I didn't want to limit myself. 
You know, there's just so much, there's so much talents come through USC. I mean, really, we should almost do it by decade, but I think people might get sick of that after the third or fourth week. So we're, we're going we're gonna to chunk it down. Maybe we could do 60s, 70s, and 80s, put that together. That's a lot right there as well. I don't know. I don't know how yeah. we're going to do it. But um, but maybe we Love can it. chunk it. Love down. it. Okay, because, uh, I mean, if I, I did one for Mark Rogers, so I'll do my overall. This is my, my, my entire, you know, since USC is kind of rough to do, but I had uh, Reggie Bush. I had Reggie Bush. Uh, then I had, who did I have? Oh, then I had uh, Ronnie Lott, Junior Seau, and well, I guess he had a quarterback. So, and I'm, this is the reason why. Here's what it is. I put Matt Liner on there because when I think of the presidents, you think who's on the Mount Rushmore. We have some great presidents, but really we all know, if you're a historian, you know it's it's not the president that actually defines. It's the era that president is is over uh, residing over, presiding over. So really it's when you kind of come in. And so with Matt Liner, what he accomplished, I think is what puts him onto that that list. I think obviously you could argue uh there's other quarterbacks, you know, like Carson Palmer and, and Caleb Williams, but as far as accomplishments are concerned, that's why that's why I they had the face the face of those two thousands, you know, was Reggie and and Matt. So that's why I slapped them up there. All right. Well, we got our call coming in. Caller, thanks for calling in tonight. Appreciate you being here. You're off Matt and Tim. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey guys, Dave from Iowa. Hey Dave, how you doing? Good, good, good. Um, well, so first off, uh, you know, in terms of uh what you what you were talking about earlier in terms of the Mount Rushmore. I completely agree with, you know, the guys that you listed. It's pretty hard to deny any of those guys a spot, honestly, on, on USC's uh, Mount Rushmore, so to speak. But uh, what I wanted to talk about was I was kind of surprised during the season that maybe it was just kind of some of the USC reporters that I was following weren't really reporting it, so to speak. But midway through the season, uh, Mark Culkin brought up the idea in terms of like, what is the identity of this USC football team? Or sorry, what is the identity of this offense? And Lincoln Riley didn't really say off or didn't say run or pass. It was just, Hey, at the time, just, you know, it's the number one offense in the country. Right. Um, and then we kind of saw the offense struggle towards the end of the season and Lincoln Riley, even using trick plays, obviously the great one against Washington and the surprising early one against Oregon. And usually when it comes to trick plays, that's, that usually happens when, in a sense, you know, the other team is somewhat more skilled than, the, than, than your team from that, in terms of skilled defense versus, you know, or, you know, skilled defense versus somewhat skilled offense. And I was just curious, do you think towards the end of the season, the, the, the opposing teams uh, kind of saw and figured out, not completely Caleb, Caleb Williams and Lincoln Riley, but it's kind of what they were doing and Lincoln Riley needed to do those trick plays to kind of, you know, keep the defense on their toes. And of course to like, you know, m you know, make a play when it need to, of course, for the, in terms of the USC and Washington um, trick play. Sometimes not about talent. I'm sure Matt's going to be affiliated more than me, but <clears throat> I think you brought up a point there when you said keep them on their toes because there was an issue. We all knew we had issues on the offensive line, right? And that's, that's where it started and stopped with what stalled our offense last year. So sometimes you are going to run those trick plays to not only uh, take advantage of something you might see they're doing, uh, but, but also to keep, to keep them more honest, keep them uh, more balanced. Right. And, and not taking advantage of the fact that the right side of that bull last year, Matt, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I think that the, the trick plays were a function and product of the offensive line, not being as dominant uh, as, as Lincoln hoped, as we all hoped, um, you know, when you're, when you're winning battles at the line of scrimmage, you don't need to deviate from a basic formula and, and trick plays are a, a reflection. Usually not always, but usually they're a reflection of, of the reality that you don't think you're matching up as well physically, uh, as you hope to. And so you need to be clever, uh, and you need to, uh, throw something into the mix that you think can solve or outfox uh, the opposing defense. So, like that—that's that's my read on on the trick plays. Uh, you could also say against Washington that you know that was also a product of you know we need to keep pace. 
We need to keep pace in, in, in an ultimate shootout. But I think just that the larger reality is that the trick plays came from a certain degree of urgency and, and urgent, not in a good way. You know, it's that oh, this this game, the game flow isn't really going our way. We need to make something happen. And it did happen. But, you know, it still is reflective of a larger situation in which you're not establishing the territorial dominance that you expect to. Uh, so like that, that it wasn't really a pleasant, you know, underlying subtext for those trick plays in 2023. Gotcha. Gotcha. I understand. Um, in terms of just to have a little fun kind of deal and to kind of see if you guys know your sports movies, but if the offensive line was that poor, why don't we just, how come the offensive scheme wasn't the veer? If you know what I'm saying? You got me. Cause I, I'm, I'm not getting that reference. We are Marshall. The movie, I, I I have to admit I've only seen parts of it. So, oh hmm. okay, okay okay, but uh, all right, never mind then. Um, you know, thanks for your answers, guys. I really appreciate it, and it's always good to call in and talk to you guys. Fight on, fight on. Thank you. Thanks for calling in, Dave. Yeah, I, I'd have to say that that is the movie that I always walk in on when people are watching. Like back in the day, I, I walk in and someone was watching it, and then I watched so many little parts of it that I've never actually hunted it down to watch the complete movie myself. But uh, I, I obviously it's a great movie. Matt, well, guess what? I think the show's over because we're out of calls. Thank you so much for being here. I talked to Gary and I talked to I talked talk to Dave. So my my week is complete. Um I don't know what to do. Uh so have you had time to think about the uh the Mount Rushmore, Matt? Yeah. So I think you have to put Reggie Bush and Matt Leinert on there and you know, with Leinert, some might compare him to kind of a Ken Dorsey at Miami that, you know, he was, uh, you know, a game manager. But, you know, when you consider the clutch plays he made in really big situations such as fourth and nine uh, at Notre Dame in 2005 uh, and, and the way he stepped in as a youngster at Auburn in 2003 and just immediately provided that elite leadership for USC. And when you realize that, you know, USC was still really good with John David Booty and Mark Sanchez, but those guys stubbed their toes, you know, and Matt Leiner didn't. And, and you have to honor that from Matt Leiner. So like, that's why he, and not Caleb Williams uh, belongs on Mount Rushmore. Uh, I think you have to put Sean Cody uh, or at least if nothing else, you have to get someone from wild bunch too. Uh, the defensive line in the early 2000s that kind of restored the, the standard. Patterson, yeah, all those guys. Yeah, you have you have to have one of those guys. Really, you can pick one. I I think my main thing would be you have to have one of those. You you can't like you can't have a, a Mount Rushmore in the Pete Carroll era without at least one of those elite defensive linemen. Let's remember that. Um, you know the 2004 win over Aaron Rodgers and Cal. You know, that was the defensive line standing on its head, you know, in a game that where Cal, you know, if, if Cal didn't outplay USC for most of that game, Cal certainly had USC sweating bullets and USC really needed to, you know, put everything in the tank uh, on defense to somehow limit Cal to just 17 points that day. So you have to have one defensive lineman. And then I would say either, um, uh, Ray Malaluga or Brian Cushing. Uh, you could also go with Taylor Mays, but you like you would need you need a second defensive player. I think you have so you have Bush and Leinart on offense, a deep one of those one of Wild Bunch two, and then either one of the elite linebackers uh, or uh, Taylor Mays uh, on the defense. I think you know that would be in some combination or another. That's how you get the Mount Rushmore. And, and I did that same thing. I fell victim to literally just those early Pete Carroll teams because, I mean, maybe we should have just kept it to a Pete Carroll by himself because you have so many guys also when you, when you talk about in the, in the, in the team, 20 teens. I mean, you got Sua Cravens, you know, on, on defense. You have a Dory Jackson uh, out there running around. And then all the wide receivers of the of 20 teens. Um, it's, it's just, it's just kind of hard to do. That's why I was hoping – we're going to stop now. I hope we get some uh, callers to, to, to tune in on it. Thank you, Carl, for calling in and saving us. Appreciate you being here with us. You're on with Matt and Tim. What's your name? Where are you calling from? 
Uh, it's Jackson Johnson from Meridianville, Alabama. How are you guys doing tonight? Jackson, doing great. How are you doing? Oh, doing all right. Had a pretty busy Friday. Did did the basketball show with Will, and uh, I, I did episode 28 of Jackson with Mark Zelmetto, host of Locked On UConn. How are you guys doing tonight? Fantastic. My favorite show of the week. <laughs> well, I want to go over a little bit about the Mount Rushmore of USC. I mean, obviously, Reggie Bush and Matt Liner are there. I mean, they, they were, oh, man. And Lindell White, oh, man, he, he was amazing right there. I always loved watching that. The amazing running back duo from the two thousand from the dominant era of the two thousands from USC. Well, you got three now. <laughs> That's the problem. They fill up fast. Yeah, you know. Um, what, what do you have for your fourth? Uh, got to get someone on defense, Jackson. Someone. Yeah, we need one one person on defense. You can't have all. You can't have four offense. You got like Pete Carroll, like the the dean of D. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, I guess I could put uh, Clay Matthews on there. Okay. That works. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Hey, 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 if Gary from Dana Point says it, like, we, we put stock in it. Yeah, well, I mean, I was thinking, so when, when I did mine right away, the first names, I, I was very biased towards the Pete Carroll. It, it was, so you had Matt and Reggie. You had to have those, so they popped in. And then, like you said, you know, that first really big name, recruit so sean cody uh and all those great uh, trojan defenses that he was in the middle of and then i and i thought to myself am i gonna do like taylor mays or am i gonna go with uh one of the linebackers like you said maluga washington cushing you know Mayaba was a good yeah but but he was on the level of those guys but those four linebackers are just just insane uh level and, and of all of them uh, I, I don't know why but cushing stuck out in my head the most because he just seemed like he was just a big part of that defense as well but like I said, you could move into the 2000s. Talk about defense. Put any of the guys I just named. Put a Dory Jackson, you know, a Sua Cravens on those teams, and, and they're big names on those teams as well. So you, sometimes you're just kind of going to take advantage or, or or maybe you're prisoner to, to your era or your team because um, it, the thing's not supposed to be a team award, a national championship award. It's supposed to be player, but it's just so hard not to get caught up in that Camelot of those Pete years. You know what I mean? That that is true, you know, because I mean the Pete Carroll years, they were they were some great years at USC, and you know the Lincoln Riley years, I, I think they could be just as great. I mean, I, I think everybody gets a little too upset about 2023, which is understandable and all, but I, I think 2024 is going to be a very fantastic year for USC. I, I think Trojan Nation is going to be really happy with it. Hope you're right, buddy. That's what we're hoping. We got to get, you know, there's a, there was a picture they threw up that, uh, and they were talking about just how, how big this defensive line is getting. Um, and it's uh, sure Benny Wiley conversation, Matt, uh, but the, these guys are, are looking just stout and bigger across the board. They showed a picture of Bear Alexander was it last week or the week before. Maybe it was two weeks ago. Guys, guys are looking big. You know, he's you got to remember how young Bear Alexander is, you know, and now he's still, the bear's still growing. So uh, it's gonna be interesting what huge leap he's gonna take next. So, yeah, I just gotta I'm, say I'm, for, for all for all the people who have been hounding me about <laughs> Benny Wiley, okay, and and I go go back to what Gary from Dana Point said that we try to keep it real and honest here, right? At the Voice of College Football, we're just gonna we're interested in the truth. We're not interested in selling a narrative. All right, so far, so far. In 2024, from everything we're hearing, everything that's being reported by the 247 Sports beat guys like Chris Trevino, Benny Wiley seems to be doing a good job. Okay, it's like I'm not, like I am not emotionally invested <laughs> in seeing Benny Wiley fail. Right, <laughs> right. I, I think skepticism of his performance to this point is warranted, but. If he do, if he does the job, like that's great. Like I want that to happen. So so far, we're we're getting good some good indications about Benny Wiley, and I hope it continues. Believe it or not, we're seeing a lot of predictions in in the um, 
in the chat. And here's what here's what I'm gonna say. Anybody that watched the defense the last couple of years just saw huge, just huge issues on just lining up, you guys. Just just having guys, you know, playing sound, you know, get, getting the run fits together, the gap integrity, knowing what your assignment is, guys not running wild, wide open. You know, the, the number one receiver just wide open running down the field. I, th these were issues that USC had, and yet USC was in most of those games, won 11 games in the first year with that defense that was very, like Matt, you talked about, very opt opportunistic. Took advantage of, of uh, what they what they had, you know, just balling out, playing hero uh, ball on the defensive side, right? Getting those turnovers. Imagine. Let's just say that it's going to take us. I'm not sure to say it's going to be because I think our offensive lines get better. But let's just say you you lose a guy like Caleb Williams, your def, your offense is definitely going to have to take a step it back at least initially. But I really do believe the difference in the defense this year just. Going off of how quickly Lynn was able to turn around UCLA, listening to how he's going to do the same. He basically, he talked to 247 Sports and uh, USCfootball.com just this week, and he was talking about the fact that you know he's going to take it slow. He's going to install slow, the basics slow, and then slow, as, as in the fall ball and then into the season, he's, they're still going to be working on the nuances of defense, but the basics are going to be in there. What that does is allows your athletes to play fast, right? Go to the ball, know what their assignments are, know what they need to do. And, and I honestly think that just on the defense side of the ball, shoring that up, not giving 30 points a game up every single game, 40 game, 40 points a game is going to be a huge difference. And, let's, and also, let's face it. Remember, D, uh, Big Ten, I, we love you coming. We're going to you guys. But there, who, who, are the, who are the offenses that USC should be shaking in the boots? Yes, USC got absolutely obliterated on defense last year, but we're not going to be playing offenses like the offenses we played last year. So there's a lot to think about in that. Um, I, I think USC, let's just wait till the roster gets finalized before we start throwing out some real pretty, sure it's fun right now, but let's, let's wait till we see a little more of that roster finalization before we start making guesses on how they're going to do because, uh, like I said, a big part of it could be how they do in November. And if they're thin, is, it might be a long, long year. Just want to say, you know, if you've been reading Trojans Wire, we're not doing those way too early 2024 predictions. We're not ranking Big Ten teams because we're we're mature adults here. You know, Tim and I want to wait for that spring portal window, want to wait for spring ball in May. In case you're wondering, in May, we will start doing, you know, early 2024 look aheads and predictions. But we don't try to get ahead of ourselves here because we're mature, serious adults. Well, Craig, really quickly. I'll be honest. Uh, no, go ahead. Sorry, I'll Justin. be honest. I, I, I don't do my predictions until I, I go get the preseason magazines in June. So that that's when it's time to go do preseason predictions. Yeah, I'm hoping to get another interview um, again. This year with Phil Steele, like I had last year, he gave us a nice half hour last year to talk USC football. So tune in hopefully for that. If we can get uh, Phil back on, that would be wonderful. Um, I agree with you. It's about that time. It, it will we'll have a better idea, right, of all those April editions because there's gonna be there's gonna be a lot there's gonna be a lot of turnover. I think what you think you have on your team and what you will have later on might be completely different. Especially USC, we're thinking about our editions. We also got to think about some of our subtractions. There might be some subtractions after, after once the depth charts go in, you know, guys spend the whole spring running with the threes and the fours. They, they might, they might, you know, say, Hey, listen, I, I've only got a year or two to do this level. Maybe I need to go look somewhere else to, to finish out my career. So yeah, we don't know what this team is going to look like in, in August, in September. Uh, and, and we don't know who's going to be here, you know, who's staying, who's coming. So, um, be careful with those predictions. But again, they're fun. That's, that's what college football is about, right? Everybody's undefeated. Everyone's winning a national championship. Everyone's on fire. Uh, but just temper that with some some optim some 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 uh, objectivity. Well, I will say th thanks for letting me call in to get, give you my Mount Rushmore for 2000 to the present on USC football. 
and y'all have an awesome rest of the show. Stay safe and stay warm. It's cold now. Absolutely. And everyone listen to The Jacksonian on YouTube. Watch for it. Follow Jackson on Twitter. Jackson Johnson bringing you the best in college football and college basketball coverage. Yeah, great call. Thank you, Jackson, so much. All right, well, um, really quick, USC Craig with the comment. 13 does not belong on a USC Mount Rushmore. Here's what I want to say. And I, I mean, look at my hat. I love Matt Liner. Love, love, love Matt Liner. But what if you put Caleb Williams on that team? With that offensive line, specifically that offensive line. You, you, you don't know, right? Too many people are hating on Caleb's. God, it, did you see how he ran for his life? All you got to do is take a snapshot of watching him in that Notre Dame game. And everyone like, says, oh, he had a horrible game. Anyone would have a horrible you know, you Irish fans, Joe Montana would have had a rough game. You know, you you Patriot fans, it, Tom Brady would have had a tough game. You know, uh, it, it, when three runners are coming right at him from the snap. So um, I, I think people need to back up a little and appreciate what he did with what he had. Uh, number 13 it is it should be up there. And I and I, I clarified it. I said basically that uh, his accomplishments aren't there. If you think of Mount Rushmore, the gentleman on Mount Rushmore, the presidents, accomplished huge things during their presidency. So I'm thinking it's not just being great. There have been some great presidents, you know, that there were brilliant minds and great guys, but they were just a victim of their presidency. And so, uh, you know, sometimes it's not the, the quality or the ability of the person. It's the situation that you're placed in. And I granted, though, you have to step up when you have that opportunity but that's why I put Matt on there because he absolutely maximized his abilities. And let's face it, look at his, look at his record. Look at what he did uh, at his time at USC. Matt, we're, uh, we're at that time again where we're kind of, you know, we're about 35 minutes into the show. No phone calls for two weeks in a row. What are we going to do? Just folks in the chat. What are your Mount Rushmores uh, for the 21st century at USC? Let's get let's get some more picks here. There we go. Yeah, you can't go wrong with again. You can't go wrong with any of those linebackers from from the, the 2018. That was just, I mean, can you think of four better linebackers? That the linebacker room back then was just. Was was abs absolutely insane. Um, I don't see any more here. Scrolling. Oh, D Rock Irish is interested in the playoff alignment. Well, I'm just, I, you know, I'm just going to say, like, if we're just going to hand out automatic bid, automatic no, not automatic bids, automatic buys <laughs> to the Big Ten and the SEC, let's just go home. I'm, I'm sorry, and I know USC is going to be in the Big Ten conference, but. You know, if, if if certain conferences just get preferential treatment, let's just let's just move this along. Let's have Florida State and Clemson go to the Big Ten. Hell, let's just have two 32 team, uh, a 32 team Big Ten and a 32 team SEC, and let's be done with it. Because come on, <laughs> you can't just say this conference gets a, a top two seed and a bye, please. And, and I know there was pushback on this. Uh, today, uh, you know, the, the idea was floated and you're seeing now the pushback, but like, this is just not a serious process right now. And we shouldn't expect anything less from college football. That's what I don't like, by the way, is, is the fact that they're, they're almost shaping it up to be, well, if you win the big 10 or if you win the, and you win the sec, boom, there's one and two, you know, I, I it's something to me about that is just kind of. It, it's it's disingenuous just just to begin with to say that, that you know a, a strong let's say a Clemson resurgence or an FSU team uh, you know puts it all together you know Miami finally gets it all together with all that talent down there in South Florida uh, that they that they can't be a one seed because they're not in the right conference that reeks of the basically of the bias that the Pac-12 got all those years and maybe that's why I'm so adamant about the fact that just anointing the winners of those conferences as the one and two. It's just, hey, come on, we've all watched football. If you've watched football long enough, you know that those teams 
there are teams out there that have those special seasons. Now, I will say this as this as the revenue flows of the different conferences do over time begin to erode some of those programs, it's going to have to do it and have the haves and have nots. It will eventually probably become that. I mean, it's heading that direction. But to to do it to have a format, especially this early, saying that these are these are going to happen, and also why do we need to have three auto bids? It's it, it, that's abs- why is there multiple auto bids? If your teams are that good, you're going to get in. Do you know what I mean? W- w- at what point do we stop this? And uh, we can talk about it in a second, Matt. But we got a uh, uh, we, we got a caller. But you know, how do you get that third bid in each one? I'm going to ask you what I asked Mark uh, a little while ago. Caller, thanks for calling in. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Augie, and I'm calling from Oxnard. I'm sorry, what was your name? Augie. Augie, oh, Augie, how you doing? I'm good. Uh-oh, we lost you. Are you there? Matt, you there? Yeah. Okay, so make sure my audio didn't drop out. Augie. Uh, we can't hear you. You there, man? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. What's yeah, on I'm your mind? here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Um, I've been to Mount Rushmore, you know, and it's unattainable. You're looking at it at a distance. It's a nice concept, but I'm going to throw a curveball. How about the Crazy Horse Monument and uh, changing it, put uh, the Trojan Horse and maybe Snoop Dogg riding it and uh, fight on, you know, <laughs> in the spirit of the underdog. You know, I just kind of feel... Uh, because at least that's something that's being built, and it's a generation, a history of the, the family that's been building it. And I feel that's in the spirit of the Trojans fighting on, and we're building it, and we're going to win it. Yeah, that's all I got to say. Well, I I, I like it. Uh, you're switching it up, Bobby. But if you, what if we held your feet to the fire and we said, hey, even from a distance, who who are your four going to be? Would you? Uh, do you have anyone different than the names that we came up with? I mean, I, again, someone earlier can't remember who it was, but basically said that, so your free space is going to be Reggie. I mean, I can't imagine anyone leaving Reggie Bush off of, of those four. Uh, that's just a given spot. But I think there's an argument for the other three positions. Uh, do you have anyone else you might want to stick on that hasn't been named yet? Well, pre-2000, we got put in honor of uh, uh, Charles White, you know, uh, legendary when they were, when we were uh, tell back you, that would be pretty awesome. Uh, uh, Anthony Munoz for uh, for being Hispanic and being uh, the man. I feel he's another person that we should have up there. And um, uh, Junior Seau, he gave it all. And uh, Ronnie Lott, those guys, they're you know they they, they were definitely a, a difference maker. And I and I feel our defense is going to reflect that with uh, all these new hires and the coaches and just. Keep it simple and, and just kick butt. And I think it's going to happen. They're going to, I see it. They're going to open up a lot of eyes and just one game at a time, one game at a time. Yeah. And John Robinson said that uh, Charles White was the toughest, I think he said SOB, but toughest player that, that he, he ever met. And he met a lot of football players. And a lot of people, young people don't realize this, but Charles White still the leader in uh, career yards at, at USC. Lost them last year. That's that's a great call. Awesome. All right. I appreciate it yeah. as always, Augie. Yeah, thank you. And and fight on, family. Fight on, Trojan. Fight on, Augie. Thank you. Okay. Tim, let's talk about another topic, a USC topic. But before that, the chat has been taken over by Pitt Football Talk. That, that's pretty remarkable. Who predicted that? And I'm just going to say, if there's a Pitt Mount Rushmore, you have to have Hugh Green on it. And I'm not seeing Hugh Green. So anyway, just wanted to address that. But now to the topic at hand, Tim, Anthony Jones Jr., the the new running back coach. We need to talk about him for our Friday night audience here on the Colin Show. And, you know, we we covered that a little bit at Trojan's Wire er, earlier in the week uh, when it happened. We talked about it on our Monday show with Mark Rogers. One thing to bring up about Anthony Jones Jr. is that he worked with Garrett Riley. So Lincoln Riley knows him well, like, like there's going to be, a, you know, they're going to blend in together. Like there's not going to be some long catch up learning process. Anthony Jones is just going to be able to be able to blend right into the staff. And when you think about it, Lincoln Riley put, you know, continuity 
as one of his themes, as one of his priorities for his 2024 coaching staff. Because remember, Danton Lynn and Eric Henderson, they were together on the 2017 Los Angeles Chargers coaching staff under defensive coordinator Gus Bradley. So there's there's familiarity there. Um, and so now you have a, a guy who's at running back coach who, you know, knows the Lincoln Riley, the, the Riley uh, playbook. You know, if you know Garrett Riley's playbook, you know pretty much Lincoln Riley's concepts. So I'm loving the continuity, you know, that you're not part of being a head coach means coaching your assistant coaches. And Lincoln Riley is creating a staff where he doesn't have to do too much coaching of the coaches. He's getting self-sufficient coaches who are going to just know what they need to do. Now, there's going to be some collaboration, but like there's going to be an understanding of what the structure is, what the framework is. That's why I really like this hire uh, for the new running backs coach uh, at USC. And if you're just going off the track record, what we've been talking about uh, that, that's been, it seems like the, the architecture of this staff has been Riley talking about development and NFL development. And you're seeing the the choices he has for his staff on both sides of the ball uh, are, are guys that, that are, are proven NFL developers. Uh, but also now you're talking about somebody that got players, uh, you know, from TCU and from Memphis, uh, developed them individually, got them, got them to, you know, the NFL. He has uh, what, five, I think it was five players in four years. Is that correct? That he got to the NFL, if I'm getting my numbers right, um, drafted. And that's from three players from Memphis. So uh, his, his track record ha has been has been phenomenal, um, hoping that he can continue that success uh, as uh, the running back coach at USC. Uh, I, I don't there, – there's one thing you shouldn't really worry about at USC, and that's, and that's recruiting uh, running backs. But – it just doesn't seem like we're getting those, you know, those 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 five star running backs that you used to see popping up all the time in in in, uh, in Southern California. You know, it just seems like it seems like San Diego of all cities would just have this like, great running back, whether they ended up being a true like four or five star running back or not. Uh, it just seemed like Southern California was this place where you were just going to always pull out uh, these, you know. Uh, amazing running backs. Now it seems like you're going more national for these guys, Texas, etc. That's where USC has been going. Uh, I, I thought your, your your thoughts, Matt, on on his ability probably to pull in. Now, do we need these these top five these five star guys, these super elite running backs? Because again, sometimes these running backs come out of nowhere. Well, you know when uh, when when uh, Relief Brown came to USC uh, as a freshman. Um, you know, I, I saw potential to be an electric player, like, you know, what we see in Zachariah Branch. Zachariah Branch actualized a considerable measure of his potential. Like he made some absolutely mammoth plays. I thought initially, initially at the beginning, that Relief Brown had a chance to be an electric player uh, on par with that. You know, Zach Branch, Relief Brown, I thought like, you know, well, I mean, Branch is on his way. Relief Brown, it didn't it didn't work out, but like that, it, the potential that you see with those guys recalls to mind Reggie Bush, just an, a total equation changing, instant playmaker anywhere on the field. You know, USC should be getting those kinds of guys, and and there aren't enough of them. But I will say that uh, as great as it would be to get you know a, a super electric type player, what the main thing is, is that if the offensive line can, can block, you're going to maximize the talent of uh, that stable of, of, of running back. So I do want to see USC raise the ceiling uh, at the running back position, but in the same breath, the offensive line has to do its job in order for the running backs uh, to realize their potential. I would just add that on a broader level, you know, if USC can make the playoff in 2024, it doesn't, doesn't have to win a playoff game, but if USC can make the playoff in 2024, that might be the thing that, you know, enables USC to get to the level of five-star recruiting on a much more consistent basis. We did talk a lot in last year's offseason, Tim, that winning is going to sell the program. Winning 
proof of concept. That's the number one thing you can do to raise the bar in recruiting. And USC has to go out and do that. And getting guys to the NFL. So, yeah, I, I agree. Get that brand, you know, win games, get guys. It's, it's a very simple formula. I think they've done it in Alabama for years. <laughs> They're doing it in Georgia, done it in Ohio State. Win football, get your guys to the NFL, and then it's just this pipeline. There's a reason why you see a log jam at the top of the recruiting rankings, and they always are the same teams. It's because they have coaching staffs that are proven to win and coaching staffs that are proven to develop players and get them ready for the NFL. Gary, thanks again, uh, Gary, from Dana Point for the $20 Super Chat. Appreciate you being here as always um, and, and leading off the show with that great call. Also uh, wanted to thank Jeff Rodriguez. Thank you so much for uh, your $10 Super Sticker. Appreciate you and, uh, being a member as well as uh, that $10 Super uh, Sticker. And then um, Adam, I haven't seen you in the chat yet, but you showed up big here with the 20 uh, thank you for the twenty dollars super chat. Hey guys, Matt. So go ahead, Matt. So what's the reason you believe that our defense will be more effective this year? And then he just wants me to talk about how much of a disgrace the baseball team is. Yeah, you know, even though they won. So Adam, we don't have Alex Grinch. We don't have Dante Williams. We do have Danton Lynn, Eric Henderson, Matt Entz, Doug Belk, and Taylor Mays. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it's gonna be the coaching, uh, and it's gonna be the development of these guys uh, and another year, the guys that we did have along with the guys that we've brought in a lot. Also with a lot of those freshmen that came in, because really that was, that was their first full recruiting class uh, watching this, the young guys. Remember we got to see some of the people they brought in through the, through the portal and some guys that were, that were playing their butts off, but we didn't have a chance to see guys. This is going to be the year where we're going to see, man, does, does uh, do Lafitte or Green show up and, and and show their size? You know, we have Elijah Hughes. Is he going to step up and, and and have a great great season? Lucas has been in the wings. Is he going to step up? We brought over an Isaiah Rakes. I think the defensive line is looking is looking pretty damn stout. So, I I, I think there's a lot of reasons to be excited. And look, guess what? We started talking defense. We got a phone call. Oh, never mind. I know this number because he calls so often. Adam, how are you doing tonight? Hey guys, how are you? Doing All right. Great. Thank you for the super chat. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks a lot. Another great show. I just had one question for both of you, and I guess I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here. Alex Grinch was criticized universally by everybody. Now, I would like you guys to articulate for me. Alex Grinch was so bad, such that you can't place any blame on the players and their execution. Because I think I question the assumption that just because you have better coaches, you're going to have a better defense. I know people are going to think I'm crazy for saying this, but what exactly about Grinch was said that you think these coaches are going to improve given the players that we have? And thanks for taking my question, guys. I, I think, Adam, the thing, the thing with Grinch, he sucked at everything. Like, it's not as though he had one Why? micro micro targeted flaw over here in a corner, you know, this one small subset of what he did. He was bad at everything. The scheme. Who played? <laughs> you know, how how he taught technique, you know, uh, you know, the culture that he developed, the accountability that he never cultivated, like w what did Alex Grinch do well? Like you there isn't anything. I mean, I guess the, the, the one the one thing you can say that he did well, and this was only the first half of that first season, he, he got his team to take the ball away. Like in the first six weeks of 2022, USC was the takeaway machine, and it was remarkable. And he was teaching for the turnover. So that's the, like, that's the one good thing he did. Everything else was awful. Everything. So, you know, the, like the, 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 it, that's, that's really the – it's a positive for this staff because you don't just have to improve. Your USC will not just improve in one area. It's going to improve in several areas. And that is going to create what I've written about at Trojans Wire. It's a multiplier effect. That improvement in all of these different smaller silos, these specific facets, it's going to multiply and it's going to create exponential improvement. And you also got to remember there's a this guy called 
Tuli Tui Pelotu that makes a, a defense just look a lot better. He was causing, we're talking about those turnovers. He was, when he wasn't getting to the quarterback and when he wasn't sacking the quarterback, when he wasn't dropping guys for losses, giving them third and long where they have to throw the ball, more likely to throw an interception, et cetera. Uh, there were players on, on that team in 2022 that really were difference makers as far as, as getting the ball turned over. I, I don't know what really to say between the two years and why one was m better in a way. It was simply statistically it wasn't, but there was able to get those turnovers led the country and, and, and takeaways. But overall I, it, yeah. it was the same kind of stuff. Thing? Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I appreciate that. I'm just, but Alex Grinch is not responsible for USC not being able to tackle. Alex Grinch is not responsible for their failure to execute. And there were several games, like against Notre Dame, that we performed well. I'm not saying Grinch was a good coach by any means, Matt, and I, I understand your point. But a lot of it is still on the players, and that's why I asked the question, why you think our defense will be more effective? And I think it's going to be more on the players than the coaches. But, guys, thanks for a great show, as always, for taking my call, um, and I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, fight on. I would just I say, know. Adam, Adam. It's the job of a defensive coach yeah. to teach his yeah. players how to tackle. Like, like that that's as elemental yeah, as it gets. You know, you know, remember, remember, you remember that well, NFL films clip? Remember, remember that NFL films clip of Vince Lombardi on the sideline? Blocking and tackling, blocking and tackling. You know, what in the world is going on around here? Like <laughs> Vince Lombardi, you know, yeah. like his job was to make sure his team could block and could tackle. And if he didn't get that, like the fear of God would be put in you. Like, so like, yes, it's the coach's job to teach the players how to tackle. You don't just get, bring players in your program and well, okay, boys go tackle. You know, no, there's teaching to this. Football's a very layered, complicated I, I know. Game. I tell my students to study for the final exam and half of them just don't study. I mean, at some point the players have to have the self-motivation, but I hope you're right. And I hope I'm wrong. I really do. Um, but like I said, great show as always. And uh, thanks for, thanks for taking my question. And uh, thanks for your support. USC baseball is going to come back. Yeah. We're, we're, yeah thanks well, guys. It, they had a nice win the other day. Um, yeah. They're, they're going to have to, they're, they got to get, they got to tighten some stuff up. There's, there's no doubt about that, Adam. Um, and, and you bring up good points. Yeah, it's well, not, it's not, positive. it's not all one or the other. We, 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 we do know that, but there is a common denominator and the defense was just bad. And we can't throw that, you know, you can't throw that on the players because it does start at the top. It does start with, you know, putting them, putting the cornerbacks on the Island. We didn't have a Makai uh, Blackman last year. You know what I mean? Who again could right. be that lockdown yeah. guy by himself and, and, and take away a wide receiver one. That you know that that we that was was absent last year and we got torched because of it. And I would just say I would just add to this: Taylor Mays took hold of this defense after the end of the regular season. He had one month before the Holiday Bowl with Dante Williams out of the picture, Alex Grinch out of the picture. Taylor Mays got this team to tackle in one month. So like like it it, it shows that. So the, the players were capable of being taught. They were receptive to information, to learning. But Taylor Mays was able to actually communicate and create accountability, whereas Grinch and Dante Williams could not and did not. Okay, fair enough. Like I said, I hope you guys are right. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see this year. So thanks for such a great answer, guys. And, uh, you know, like I said, fight on. Right on. And Adam, thanks for supporting the show in the many great ways. Great talking that you to you guys. Do. Thank you. Talk to you next week, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Have a great night. All right. Take care. All right. Well, I think that we're out of calls. It's been an hour. I was going to get into, um, well, we, we could save it for, for another day, but, I, you know, um, I can say this to, to wrap up. We just said with there, uh, why are we so confident in the defense getting better? I would say it just like this. I can't see it getting worse. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you know, the USC was at the bottom statistically of every category. And, um, 
you know, I, I can't imagine the level of dysfunction with the quality of players. Because here's what I would say, Adam. How much do I know how much was Grinch? Because the, the players that we had in that locker room should not have been should not have statistically been as bad as they were on the field there. I'll leave it at that. So why don't I think they better? Because I do think that Lynn is bringing in a system that's proven in the NFL that he proved last year at UCLA. And I think that they have improved, especially in the interior defensive line. I think rakes is going to, uh, is going to surprise the, the combination of rakes, you know, and bear Alexander are going to surprise a lot of people. I think with the the, the uh, outside rush uh, guys that we're going to have coming in as well, you know, wait, you see Braylon Shelby. He was just a freshman. That gigantic human being was just a freshman. Now we'll see him with some sophomore strength and wait on, see what he could do. I think you could see superior um, uh, defensive line play. And then when you want to talk about getting ready for, you know, through spring, all the way through fall camp, you're also going to have uh, just, just better coaching on the defense all the way across the board, you know, Matt Entz bringing that toughness, bringing in the simplifying the defense for these linebackers to get up field and, and, and do some damage. Um, I, I, again, Matt, I, I don't, there's when I think, how is it going to be better? I keep saying one, how's going to be worse. And then I can't think of how we took a step back in anything that we've done. So th that's the logic I'm going with as far as USC is going to be better on defense. All right. Well, it's been an hour, Matt. You know, uh, appreciate the calls. They were limited, but listen, sometimes I say it's not quantity, it's quality. Uh, and I do appreciate uh, Gary from Data Point calling in, Dave from Iowa, Jackson Johnson, thank you. Augie uh, called in, uh, and then uh, we just had Adam. And who was before Adam? We had someone right before Adam. Dave from Iowa. No, I got him. I'm sorry, Cole. I, I dropped, I, I, didn't, I didn't write down. And if I don't write down... On Jackson. a Friday, as much as Jackson. I got Jackson, got Jackson too. On a Friday, you guys, uh, you know, I'm pretty tired. This is my favorite thing to do, but it is the end of the week. So I apologize, caller, whoever you were. Thank you for calling in. Uh, we have our show, as always, every Monday night. Uh, we have a new time, 7 Pacific, uh, 10 Eastern. You can join Matt, Mark, and I as we get together for the Trojan Conquest Live. Um, and remember you know, to spring forward, everybody. That's right. Make sure that you set your clocks properly. That's that's a very good point, Matt. Uh, and then also, uh, I can't let a week go by, even though I did on Monday. But we talked about the goats. Uh, add, add uh, see, that was Monday, so add five. So that's now uh, 4,902 days since those crooks over at the NCAA took that man's trophy back. Please give it back. Get out in front of history so you don't look more foolish than you already do. So, Matt, thank you for uh, putting up with me for another hour as we talk to Trojan fans. Fans, you guys, this is your show. Make sure you come back next week, 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, where we is the not the last, but it is the first, where it's your show. Tonight, it's the offseason. I thought maybe we could talk about uh, Mount Rushmore. That one went over like a Led Zeppelin, but we, we will try something else next week. Uh, maybe we can get some more, generate some more interest uh, in the call queue. Any final words, Matt? Nope. All right. Make sure you're supporting House of Victory as well, you guys. You want to talk about getting in the recruits and everything, this is your chance. Go to uh, uh, www.houseofvictory.com. You can pick and support whatever sport or athlete you want to do. That's the place to do it. Also, if you can, go ahead and hit that subscribe button for us. Uh, we appreciate you all being here. Still trying to get, we're on a road to 10,000. We hit that 5,000 barrier. Now our next step is going to be 10,000. Appreciate you all being here. Uh, until next Monday, everybody out there, fight on.